Whoops. All right. So you're calling the pre-meeting to order then, sir? Yeah, we're we're pre-meeting is in session. <laughs> Just give it the video. Let's get the training going. Okay, so <clears throat> This last legislative session, again, the legislature uh, made some strides in erosion of local authority of land use. I'll put it that way. Hope nobody records that. Oh, we're being recorded. Okay. Um, and the, we've cities have had moderate income housing plans for probably 12, 15 years now. Western's always been compliant. However, the last a few years they've become more um, aggressive uh, in their approach. I guess they're not seeing the result that they thought uh, they would get from a moderate income housing plan. And as you can read uh, up there, you know, this planning commission, I think members on this planning commission have probably been through Matt, maybe three versions. You know, maybe all of you have been around for a little bit now, so maybe two or three versions of the moderate income housing plan. It, you know, for all intents and purposes, it needs to be updated every couple of years. Um, and so, but they've got a little more, um, what I should say, a little more aggressive on their goals. They're not calling them goals anymore, they're calling them strategies. And so a city of the first class uh, needs to have at least four strategies. And because West Jordan has uh, six track stations, if you have a track station or at all, what do they call it, Duncan, a major transportation corridor, uh, you have to have two additional goals. Um, and, and I'm gonna, if I, if I say goal, please correct me, it's strategies now. And so they have to be created and approved by the city council. And what it is, is um, if the city council chooses not to adopt six new strategies uh, by October 1st of this year, uh, there, there could be consequences. And so uh, cities of the first class that adopt their modern income housing strategies, which West Jordan is required to have six. As you can see the third, actually the dot, the transportation commission may give priority consideration to transportation projects located within West Jordan. And then two, there's also governor's office and planning and budget may give priority consideration uh, for awarding financial grants to the city. One thing you do, a goal to strive for is to be uh, on that list of priority consideration. Uh, I don't think, you know, and what, what the consequences that will be, I don't know at this point, it's so new, the law hasn't even gone into effect till June 1st. But we have to have the six goals to the uh, state by October 1st. Now, it's not the whole plan this time. It's just six new strategies. And the very last sentence, you can see if the city fails to adopt these, the state can withhold transportation and other program funding. They've been threatening that for a few years, but they've actually have that signed into law now. Um, so in the drafting, uh, the implementation plan for the modern income housing element, the planning commission needs to establish a timeline for implementing each of these strategies. Um, before it used to be you'd adopt your goals or strategies and then here you go, thank you very much. Uh, now you actually have to put a timeline in and how it's going to be implemented. And the way to do that is identify specific measures and benchmarks for implementing each uh, strategy. And whether it's one time or ongoing, uh, one time goal would be, for instance, the, the goal in the previous plan that was already um, adopted that's AD ordinance. You know, that's a one-time thing. Ongoing would be using 
uh, community development brought block grant funding to preserve and upgrade moderate income housing. And, and the reason that I've been cut off, or, there we go. The reason that is, uh, you know, can be considered moderate income housing uh, is that it is income qualified for the people that get block grant money. A millionaire can't apply to the city and get any block grant money for weatherization or a new roof on their house where people that are income qualified, most of the time they're senior citizens and uh, can apply for that. And then the third bullet point is uh, we need to work some kind of flexibility uh, strategies, um, you know, to adjust as needed. So I think that that's uh realistic you know i'm a fat guy i want to lose 50 pounds but my goal to lose it by next week ain't gonna happen okay so you know what i mean and so what i want to try to do is go through as much of this as possible so that we can uh you know limit the time in the regular meeting unless you want to talk a long time in the regular meeting i know we've got a lot of things on the agenda um duncan do you have anything you want to say real quick about uh, as far as training goes before I actually get into the goals. Um. Yeah, I could probably just chime in. This is not just training, right? I mean, we also, I, I know the staff would like to hear your input. There are some uh, choices, right? I mean, you could, uh, if you find that one of these other goals or strategies, I guess, is more it has a higher priority maybe than the six that staff is recommending, then they could easily change it out and put one or two other ones in. So, I mean, you kind of have a pulse of what's happening in the community and what might be a good strategy. And we're not just trying to meet the requirements that the state has, but we're also trying to find ways that in this tough environment actually helps provide more affordable housing for people right i mean that's the ultimate goal of modern income housing is it is it really working is it really providing some additional opportunities for people to stay here rather than move somewhere else so but uh, yeah so think of it as training but also input on something that's really important and <clears throat> i really haven't come up with any recommended goals for the planning commission i want to have a good dialogue tonight and see what the planning commission uh, would like to do. There's almost the whole alphabet. It goes to X, uh, Y, and Z were left out. I'm sure that's for 2023. Um, <laughs> but so I certainly can come up with recommended goals, but I would like to at least go through them and get planning commission input. And so to jump, cut right to the chase, since we have the two track stations, we have to have two additional strategies in addition to the four. And the state has made it very easy. They let you do letter V, G, H, or Q. Letter V is uh, unavoidable. You know, we have to do it. Develop and adopt stationary plans in according with Section 109A4031. What that means is that within a half mile of every track station, the city either has to adopt stationary plans, which we have, or update them. So that work will be going uh, ongoing in the next couple of years here in the city. Those have to be into the state by 2025. Uh, so QGNH is create a housing and transit reinvestment zone. And I don't know a lot about that. That generally uh, deals with um, the front runner lines, cities that have on front runner lines. But I do think there's a component for track stations. Uh, amend land use regulations to allow for higher density, for new moderate income, residential development and commercial or mixed use zones. And the major transit investment corridors, we'll just call it the tracks line, because that's what it means. Or amend land use regulations to eliminate or reduce parking for residential development. Um, and so which of those three, uh, Q, G, and H, would the Planning Commission feel most comfortable with recommending to uh, the City Council? Uh, you could 
tell me to go back and do a little more research on all of them if you want. I can tell you H and the mayor may, the mayor can um, probably validate this point, but that was not popular with the city council on reducing parking. Uh, however, it is one of the three that we have to choose from. So, so we have to come up <laughs> with six strategies out of these four. One of them's already given to us. One more out of this list, and then we'll go on to the other list. So, okay, so you have them like sectioned off. Yeah. So we have to do yeah. it. Okay. So th this is we have to do two out of these four, but. Really, you only have the choice of three because one, they've already made the choice and, for you. And you said the transit investment corridors, that doesn't include major roads like 5,600. No, no. Only where there's an actual train line. Yes. Okay. Now, I could go back and do more research on that and see if it's a viable option uh, for the city, but be mindful if it's a strategy, um, then we have to work towards that end to see if it's possible. Do you have any more on this Housing and Transit Reinvestment Zone Act? I mean, I, you said you kind of give us very quick. I, I don't have any more. I'd have to go back and do research and, and bring that back to the next meeting, but I'd be happy to do that. I think I need to know more about Q and G before I can make a decision since H is not an option. And G, you know, and I mean, is it different than just our normal TOD? It, it, really, it really wouldn't be a lot different. Um, but so, if the rest of the commission's in agree in agreement, I will do more research on Q and G, and bring that back to the next meeting because. Where we already have densities in our TOD areas up to 40 to 75 units an acre, do we have to increase that or can we establish a timeline for some of these developments to go forward? So I, I guess in terms of just moving this through, I would be more in favor of G just because it shouldn't, even if it requires a tweak, it would, tweak, it would be less than coming up with anything else at this point. Okay. That would be my vote. I'd like to know more about the queue though too. So yeah. okay. but I'm with Matt. She's probably more of a viable option. Okay. And especially since we've already got a bunch of TODs either in the planning stages or going. I mean, I think that would already kind of put us a little bit ahead of the game anyway. Yeah. And quite frankly, H the parking around uh Track stations is already lower, and we have issues because of it, truthfully. Because, you know, I guess gas has to go to $9 a gallon before people start riding the. I don't know how expensive gas has to be. I guess maybe it needs to become more convenient. <laughs> maybe I think convenience is probably the big hindrance to riding public transportation right now. I know before COVID, though, that especially the track station over by the mayor's house, it was packed all the time. Yeah. And it was I, hard. I think, yeah. Yeah. To find any any uh, parking. So even the one over by my house has been fairly, fairly well packed. Yeah. I used to ride the tracks to work all the time. Okay. Same way. <laughs> Just opposite. All right. I walked backwards, though. So. so I'll do more research on Q and then we'll look at doing G as a, a, a strategy to present to the city council. So Larry on that? Yes. Um, I would like to see it with, I think it was G coming back. You said it's within half a mile of a track station. Yes. Can we get an image of each of the track stations sure. half a mile around it? As part of that, I'm curious how much development there actually is available a in lot. those areas. It's massive. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I think you already answered this. I, there probably isn't much chance of UTA expanding tracks further into West Jordan. Um, probably not in the near term. Yeah, you know, but as I think as the valley grows out towards the west, there are some rail lines that may be used, but. 
that's it's millions and millions of dollars and so far out there not worth considering millions and millions options. of dollars of additional federal debt you know <laughs> so yeah. well. all right so then <clears throat> these are so we need to come up with four um new strategies remember the uh, adopting the ad ordinance that satisfied that goal we can't use that again uh, rezone for density is necessary to facilitate protect production of modern income housing uh, is that something the planning commission is interested in uh, you know i think that there may be areas of the city that uh, in the near future are probably going to be rezoned that could facilitate this. So this may be a self-fulfilling strategy. Uh, demonstrate investment in rehabilitation or expansion of in infrastructure that facilitates the construction of modern income housing. Um, I don't really know what that means for West Jordan. I would have to do more research on that. Demonstrate investment in the rehabilitation of existing uninhabitable housing stock into moderate income housing. I don't know if, when I worked for South Salt Lake years ago, we had a lot of uninhabitable housing stock. I don't think that's the case in West Jordan. Um, and so that would, and we have to demonstrate investment. Uh, so I guess Duncan, if I read that, goal correctly if we found two homes that were uninhabitable and you know i don't know who yeah, there's no that. minimum requirement yeah, so, yeah let's so go see if we can find it yeah. is that a goal maybe identifying you you utilize general fund subsidies of revenue to waive construction related fees that are otherwise generally imposed so that would be impact fees building permit fees application fees are there any four any of those four that the planning commission is in love with and would like me to on on a the the uh, ilz doesn't yes, qualify so, here yes or is it because we already used no, it we haven't rezoned anything to other than the one uh yeah, property copper rim we did but, copper so, rim but there's others other ones that are either there's or probably possible. three yeah. or four so, other properties that, but my recommendation would be to put that down as a goal because i think we can do something measurable in the next few years on that so I'm, I'm just looking at this, so I don't necessarily want to do the easiest way out, which for me eliminates C, because it seemed like, you know, we find two houses, yay, we, we did it, right? Yeah. That doesn't move the meter for me, but on A, we kind of have the process already going, so that makes sense. The other one would be D, allowing these these more affordable housing entities to come in, and we're incentivizing them by waiving fees. I would be in favor of A or D. Okay. What about the rest of the commission? I wonder um, how horrible the, would the repercussions be if we just told the state to stick it in their ear? Uh, probably we'd lose all transportation funding. <laughs> That's pretty horrible. <laughs> I may have. I came in a couple about minutes money. Ago. Yeah, the families are quite punitive. I wouldn't recommend that strategy. Out of A and D, I would prefer A, but I, I think D is def definitely something we should at least strive for okay i agree with that okay. do we have any idea currently have you looked into what kind of dollar amount that would look for what how it would impact the city on the general fund subsidies i don't i can do more research on that so it would be just for instance you know type of thing but i can do that i i think for me it comes down to what is the difference between would I prefer a general fund subsidy or hiring two more police officers? I, I think I'm going to go toward the, yeah. the existing safety. So I, maybe from if you approach it from that angle and show us some alternatives of how that money would be spent, that's what I'd like to say. Personally, I hate waiving fees. I don't, I don't think it's a good policy to ever get involved in. But there you go. Can and we offer so, a discount? Yeah, a discount. Yeah, so it's not waiving entirely. But. Yeah. I think I, th I think Ammon's strategy is is a good one. Let's look at the the benefit <laughs> versus the expense. Okay. Um, 
So A, we've already uh, satisfied that strategy. Um, zone or rezone for residential development and commercial or mixed use zone near major transit, transit investment corridors. Um, so the city really has done that, but I don't know if we get credit for it. And so I'd have to do, you know, for instance, right across the... Okay. Thanks, Mayor. <laughs> so right across the street, when I was a, a kid or, or younger, I shouldn't say a kid, it's a young, I used to be Grand Central and Albertsons and Taco Time and all, and then it was kind of abandoned and it was rezoned to that. Is there another area in the city that that can be done with near a major uh, transit investment corridor? Uh, possibly, you know, with these ever expanding circumferences, uh, possibly amend land use regulations to allow for single room occupancy developments. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with that. I don't know. Is that like the odd fellows home uptown? Yeah. So you just ran a room at a time. Uh, implement zoning incentives for moderate income units and new developments. Uh, we have done that, but uh, that could be a strategy. Uh, I would caution on that one because, Duncan, I don't know if that ever made it into law where the city would have to subsidize that if it was moderate income housing and new developments. We'd have to look into that and preserve. Yeah, I can't remember. We'd have to check. Yeah. So, and I think preserve an existing new moderate income housing and subsidize you units by utilizing a landlord incentive program, providing deed restricted units or a grant program, or establishing a housing loss mitigation fund, uh, reduce waiver, eliminate impact fees related to moderate income housing. Again, that's another, um, you know, could be, a, could have a potential fiscal impact on the city. So before we wrap up this portion, is there any of those that the planning commission likes? Are, are we being asked to pick one from each screen that no. you give us, or can no. we completely you ignore could, this whole could, entire screen? You could, you could ignore this whole screen. If you well, the only reason I ask is, I mean, you said E may or may not have already been satisfied. Again, yes, we want to complete this, and if that's what it came down to, I'd be okay with E, but I don't think we should be looking for ways to get out of doing as much as we can. So if that, if it were true, Forced to pick one, F is where I would look at on the screen, but I'm yep. not really in love with any of these. Okay. Um, probably in a couple more minutes, we'll go over this next screen. Uh, M, demonstrate the creation or participation in a community land trust program for moderate income housing. Uh, one of our council people has already kind of broached this issue a little bit. So this may be a realistic goal. Uh, I am not an expert on land trust. I don't know what they mean other than for preservation of open space, but this obviously is really moderate income housing. I have to do some more research and bring that back to the Planning Commission. Uh, implement a mortgage assistance program for employees. Why did you do that so quick? <laughs> so we could have used that as a goal, but the mayor already did it. Okay. so. It's our goal to keep it. A goal to keep it. And so, you know, I, I don't know, Duncan, I guess we could, maybe this is an ongoing thing. It could be an ongoing goal uh, for the city. Yeah, so, I, I see where we haven't used it to count in the past. Let's use it and count it this yeah. time because it's an ongoing process. It's right, Mary. It's potentially barely got started, but potentially could go into the next year or two. So what yeah. about employees that have lived in the city for 61 years? Do you give them some kind of break? Yeah. Speaking of myself. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> All right. So any of these, those two that we want more research on or uh, or do you want to forward as a goal to the or strategy to the city council? I'd love to hear more about what M actually entails. Is that a what what is a community land trust program and if it's what i'm thinking it is we're talking about open space and trails and that kind of thing running through a community and, and kind of networking our city that's what i think of it as that would be incredible if we could bring the community in as part of that land trust and work out 
maintenance of the, the corridors and things like that and really step in and even help out the city with the parks aspect of it. Didn't the Harvard students recommend a land trust? I remember they that. did. Oh, yeah. that's right. I, I would be curious to know on, on okay. why they recommended yeah. it and what and it that might means. Be, that might be what it is, yeah, because yeah. it's typically for open space. And this is if they turn it over to or donate it to the land trust, and which would tie in with what the one council member is looking at right now is with new developments in a certain type of new zone that if they, they, they could get density buy-ups, additional density, if they donated some land to a, a land trust. And that makes sense to me. Maybe it is trails or that kind of thing, so. And Larry, on the, the prior slide, you don't have to go back to it, but that item F that was brought up, it uh, seems to me like that one would go really hand in hand with G from the prior one, where if we're looking at these sites, and we've got this half mile around the track station, I, we can consider where this would make sense. My question is, if, if the goal is to zone or rezone, do we fulfill that at least in the interim by just changing the future land use map? Because the zone or rezone has to come in from the landowner, does it not? Um, I think it's it's fairly specific. It has to be a rezone, not a land use map. So, no, the city can the city council at their discretion can rezone any property at any time. Okay. So, may not be popular, but they can do it. Okay, um, Jay, I'll let you take a three minute break. <laughs> Thank you. We'll go through the rest of these in the regular meeting, so it shouldn't take long. Yay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yay.
Thanks, Mayor. Okay, it's time to start our uh, May 17, 2022 West Jordan City Planning Commission meeting. We have all present with the exception of Commissioner Wynn. So we have five out of the six. First on the agenda is uh, approval of our uh, minutes from last meeting. I move to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, carries five nothing. Okay, next on the agenda is item two, and this is a public hearing with final actions that's going to the with just us planning commission. Sorry, I've got to read a little bit better. Um, this is the Tattoo Inc. Utah, 9109 South Redwood Road, conditional use permit for tattoo and body engraving services, PC zone, uh, Tattoo Inc. Utah in Ender Para. If you'd like to come up to the mic and speak, you might, Turn the the light. Yeah, there you go. There, we're here. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is my first time talking English with a lot of important people in front of me. That's why I would like to say you apologize about my pronunciation. I will try to do my best. Uh, this is me, I'm Ender. I'm a tattoo artist. I have been a tattoo artist for the last 10 years. But, uh, I'm sorry, Mark, where can I move my images? Okay, awesome, thank you. Uh, here's my family, my wife and my daughter. And our plan is to open one tattoo shop in 90 South with Redwood Road. Uh, it's going to be uh, a small business because my wife, she sells jewelry and she's going to open a jewelry store in the front of the shop. And I'm thinking to open my tattoo shop in the back of the shop, but it isn't going to be a big tattoo shop. It's going to be a, a special. I don't know if you ever have been in one tattoo shop. My plan is I'm trying to do something different, something more private. I only go to open three stations, the two station, one for me. And I am thinking to hire another two tattoo artists. Uh, Mark, could you? Okay, I have there my place. I am in the front of Redwood Road. I'm thin. I am like a fifteen hundred no, one hundred and fifty, oh, one hundred and fifty feet close to the triple world. And the next, and this is what I do. I brought you just a tiny bit of what I like to do. I have been a canvas painting for my whole life. I think the next. And this is what I like to do on the skin. Uh, I brought these images because I really would like to show you what is my style. I, uh, most people think, or most people say, I am a weird tattoo artist because I don't like it. My daughter always says, you look like a lawyer, you doesn't look like a tattoo artist, but, <laughs> That is what I like to do. I want to do something different. I don't like to, to appear like a tattoo artist, like a crazy guy with a bunch of beauty in the face. That's not the sense. My sense is I have been an artist and this is the way how I know how to make money to feed my family. Uh, I really appreciate if you support me with that project. Uh, like I told you in the beginning, it's a family business. We work together every time. My 
brother, she always alone, so I would like to help my wife because she doesn't speak English yet. <laughs> but uh, the main purpose of my business is just to make art and make good job to my clients. And about the uh, the impact. Yeah, the, the potential impact. Uh, I think we won't have any impact in the community because right now we use just rarity machines. They work with a motor, not with a coil, and they make any noise. They're pretty, pretty, pretty silent statue machine. And the other thing is about the traffic. I think I won't get a lot of client because i'm thinking to to help just two or three clients per day and then i think it's not going to be a a bunch of car or a bunch of clients and i think that is all any questions for the applicant okay mark you can go ahead and have a seat. Oh, I will want to show you. Can oh, you? Okay. Can you? I remind. I didn't play nothing in my in my in my hand. Just that imagine. I would like to explain you where is the distribution in my shop. Okay, that L shape in the front. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. That L shape is my my wife Joey. In the front, we have the front desk in the right of the bottom of the screen. And after we have the jewelry store in, in the back, that piece of red, the red carpet is going to be my tattoo shop. If you, the other mark, please, the other one. Uh, right there, you can see the three stations we will have, and that will be all. The other two rooms will so is going to be my wife's office and my personal office. And the last is going to be the storage in the back. And that is all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. So um, I'm just going to go over real quick, just kind of zoning. Um, thanks, Andrew, for uh, explaining that really well. Um, so this is going to be located in a PC zone. Go ahead and add the PC one. Okay. Um, uh, so the PC zone normally doesn't allow tattoo shops under the city code, but um, since this is along Redwood Road, um, this um, it's also subject to the Redwood Road overlay, which basically applies to any property that one has frontage on Redwood Road and two is not part of a residential subdivision or multifamily complex. So um, this is actually going to be uh, Westron's first tattoo shop. So it's kind of kind of new territory, but uh, we feel this should be pretty good fit. So this is kind of the surrounding area here on the map. Um, as you can see, it's uh, pretty uh, heavy on the commercial side of things. Uh, this big box retail, uh, two restaurants on either side of, of the tattoo shops. And then the residential, there's really not much in the area. The closest is 540 feet away on the other side of Redwood Road. So uh, we don't think there should be much impact on on any residential. Uh, the hours are going to be pretty reasonable. Uh, they're Monday through Saturday from 10 a.m. through 7 p.m. So uh, we're not really looking at late hours or anything like that. Uh, pretty typical for the businesses that are there. Um, uh, as Andrew explained, there's uh, not going to be any noise or dust or uh, really any parking or traffic impacts. Um, at least nothing beyond what's already there. Um, it's parking they're looking good on. Uh, they're required to have at least eight spaces. But uh, the way this is set up, you can kind of see here, uh, they've got a shared parking arrangement. And um, we did a study on that of all the businesses there and um, uh, the required parking uh, with the parking that they already have comes out to a surplus of 297 spaces. So they've got plenty of parking. <laughs> so, um, so that's pretty much it. And um, 
I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, so uh, it was like two years ago that we passed that we did that change to allow tattoo, but so that doesn't apply in this area, but only because of the redwood. Where did we put the 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 area that was allowed for tattoo shops? Oh, okay. That was my only question. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? This is in a strip mall, is it not? It is. Yeah. Thank you. I can't believe it's our first tattoo shop. So I think this is fantastic. We need it. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and open this up for a public hearing. If anybody would like to speak on this item, you'll have three minutes. Just come up to the lectern and uh, speak your name. And you have three minutes. We don't have anybody online, do we? <laughs> They look like they're forced to be here. But nobody's. Okay. We will go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back up to the commission. Am I good to go? You're good to go. I, uh, I'm going to echo what Commissioner Hatch said. I'm glad that, uh, that we're growing up. We're going to be a real big city now. So thank you guys. <laughs> we're excited for you. Thank you for wanting to do business in West Jordan. Uh, based on the information and findings set forth in the staff report and upon the evidence and explanations received today, I move that the Planning Commission approve the conditional use permit for a tattoo and body engraving service for tattoo in Utah located at 9109 South Redwood Road in a PC zone and a Redwood Road overlay with the conditions and requirements of approval that's on page two of the staff report. Commissioner Hatch. I second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, it carries five nothing. Okay, next item on the agenda is Raising Canes, 7671 South, 3800 3, West, preliminary site plan with administrative conditional use permit for restaurant, fast food, SC3 zone, and Chris Bick. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm Chris Bick. I'm the civil engineer for this project. Um, as you can see, it's located on the corner of Bangadur and 7800 South in that hatched area on the screen. Um, currently, this parcel um, belongs to uh, Walmart, and so they're selling it to develop into um, this Raising Canes project that I think will fit really well with this um, location. As you can see, there's a lot of other kind of out parcels there that are used for um, for, for, for restaurants. Yeah, and there's a El Pollo Loco that's right next door, which yes, it's a chicken restaurant, but I can guarantee that it, it tastes, um, it's a lot different taste than, than uh, Raising Cane's. So, um, so you, get, you do get the variety there, um, even though they're both chicken. Um, we've worked uh, very closely with the city staff um, uh, on, with uh, access and parking and the site layout and uh, making sure that our landscape is up to compliance, that the building height um, and uh, overall uh, site layout complies with, with the existing uses and codes. Um, um, we've done traffic impact studies. We've done parking studies, queuing studies. Um, and then also uh, infrastructure calculations for sanitary storm. Um, we're actually um, adding more landscaping to this parking lot area. And as you can see from the aerial view right there, um, that part of the parking lot is not being utilized currently um, for parking. So canes um, can come in with very little impacts to the parking of the Walmart lot. Um, we do, uh, we will be adding um, additional parking. If you can go to the, maybe one more. Yeah, so here's our, here's our site plan here. Um, so we've got parking stalls, um, which meet the demands of Canes. Um, also, we've got um, two order lanes, drive-through lanes with a, an additional bypass lane. 
um, that not only helps with getting customers through, but also in the case of like opening week or month or, or some uh, rare instances where the stacking might be a little more excessive. Um, Canes does have a crew that will go out with um, tablets, take your orders and help people get through the line without impacting the, the developments um, nearby. Um, Canes is very, very good at employing um, even off duty police officers, um, bringing their crews out there to, to help assist and, and make sure that they're a good neighbor with the surrounding community. Um, let's see, I think, just wanna make sure I'm touching on, on all the, the points that, that you guys need. Um, but yeah, architecturally and as far as use location um, setbacks, I believe that this is consistent with, with what's currently developed in that area. Um, and yeah, so just wanted to let you know that Kansas is very excited to be coming to your, to your city and, and I'm here if you have any additional questions for me. I just like to comment, I appreciate the fact you've addressed the stacking. It's a good problem to have, but it can be a problem when your restaurant is so popular. But I think it's great you addressed that and, and that third lane is awesome. So yeah. anyway, just congratulations. Thanks, yeah. And we have been working with the city and, and creating an even more um, robust um, queuing plan if, if it even comes to that as well, so. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, Mark. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so again, going over the zoning, this is located in an SC3 zone, which is the city's uh, regional commercial zone. Um, so uh, as Chris alluded to, uh, pretty much all the surroundings is uh, big box retail and uh, a lot of chicken fast food restaurants, <laughs> at least the two to the west. But uh, fast food's pretty common in, in this area. And we think, um, you know, another one is is appropriate for the area and it should fit well as far as land use goes. Um, traffic and management. Um, so they, uh, Chris mentioned that they have done a traffic study and uh, what they found is they looked at two locations um, along the Wasatch Front and what they found is that their peak times were mostly during uh, lunch and dinner hours on the weekdays and uh, Saturdays during lunchtime. And during those times, they were expecting about 15, 20 cars. So, um, so with the three lanes there, um, we think that they can actually uh, accommodate a lot of that on-site uh, traffic. Each one will probably be able to accommodate, um, or each lane, I should say, should be able to accommodate uh, six to 10 cars easily, so. <laughs> Uh, there's a few uh, conditions that we added um, just with um, some of the, with this kind of intersecting with the Walmart property, um, obviously there's going to have to be some coordination there as far as uh, access and um, some of the utility easements running through there. And so, so we've included those as conditions to um, just make sure those get done and finalized properly before uh, before final approvals. Hey, Mark, are we making a decision on which scenario we like better in this case? No, um, I, I do wanna make that clear that this is just um, showing what each scenario could be. Um, whoever they decide to uh, agree with, with access is up to them. So we, we don't necessarily wanna pay no them into a corner. No influence from our group? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because we didn't want to make sure that um, unless if, they wanted your recommendation, but it is ultimately, as Mark described, their choice. Okay. So just kind of going over the site plan here. Um, yeah, as Chris was saying, they've got um, kind of that median. You can see in between the drive through aisles uh, where employees can take orders there. Uh, we've requested that they add kind of that uh, maybe a little hard to see here, but um, where the traffic kind of splits there um, on that curve, 
they've got a raise meeting there to just kind of act as a, a bulwark for, for employees. But at the same time, we've kept that open without any curbing just to make sure employees can uh, move in and out of there as, as needed to keep that safe. Uh, the other thing too is originally we were gonna have a pedestrian path run right up the, the middle of that from the sidewalk to, to the building, um, but we've had to move that due to grading concerns. So uh, that's why you see that pedestrian access there on the Southeast corner. So with the turning radiuses, it, it was a little difficult to uh, try and make that um, as visible as possible as pedestrians are coming in and out because there's kind of a blind corner there. But uh, to mitigate that, they've added some, some fencing there, some signage and have moved that as far as they possibly can to um, provide a, as much visibility as they can um, from cars. Are you anticipating a lot of foot track coming in off of 78th just to cut in there? Uh, not a lot, but uh, it, it does happen from time to time. Uh, there is a bike lane on there on that route. So um, you could see potentially some bike traffic, but, um, but not a lot. Um, and the parking, um, we looked at uh, some of the parking requirements and um, they, as far as the on-site parking goes, they have enough um, for the indoor portion, but with the outdoor dining, that kind of raises the parking requirements a little bit. So um, we looked at more of a shared parking arrangement with the Walmart site. Um, but even with that, they will need a little bit of administrative relief for, for the parking, but it's only about four parking stalls. So with uh, Walmart's parking lot, as you can imagine, it's uh, pretty large. <laughs> and so um, just based on their needs and uh, kind of the patterns we see in the four spaces probably shouldn't make much of a difference. So. So with that, uh, I, uh, that's pretty much it. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions for staff? Oh, that was unusual. You didn't talk about the, uh, the landscaping plan at all. Can we just go over that really quick? Yeah. So the landscaping plan, this was uh, one of the plans that uh, uh, the DRC looked at earlier. So they looked at the architecture that landscaping plan. One of the comments they had was, uh, at least the plan at the time, uh, was showing quite a little bit more sod lawn area than they would have liked to see, and which was exceeding the city's codes requirements. So, so they've changed that and modified that down to uh, keep that in line with this, the city ordinances. So you can see here now they have quite a bit of xeriscaping and um, some good water conserving plants there. Commissioner Allen. I'm debating how to how to phrase this. Um, maybe I'll start with a non-substantive comment. The uh, uh, a lot of the the kids uh, in and around the area, high school kids, refer to this as a chicken run. We'll go through here and buy parts their chicken from each of the different chicken restaurants and taste it. So I'm sure they'll love to have an extra. <laughs> yeah, uh, it'll be fun. Uh, so the, I think the question I have, and, and I, I'll be clear, it looks like everything meets code. So I, from that perspective, it's not really an issue that I'm, I'm seeing. Um, I do have concern about potential negative impacts to the business next door, mm -hmm. uh, especially if the access is coming through there as well as the potentially the signage in front of that business saying, we'll go to this other business instead, or here's how to get to the other one. I don't know if we can balance that or just have that as, as we work through the site plan and that kind of stuff on an administrative level, just keep that in mind. That's about the only thing I can really say with it. We didn't really talk about the signage. I mean, we can see that on the, the proposed plan there. Can you go back to that slide and just talk what the sign plan is there? Uh, they haven't really submitted a sign plan. No, the, the most we've gotten is just the monument sign um, on 78th and then the, the existing pylon sign that's going to be moved. But beyond that, we, we haven't gotten a plan for directional signs.
Okay, um, we will call you back up and just after our public hearing, and then if you're willing to, to even take some comments on the directional stuff, we'd appreciate that also. In so, fact, your rules allow him to make a public comment once you open the public hearing, and then at the end, like you say, he can also yeah. talk again. So, okay, yeah, please. Or are you opening the public hearing now? Then yes, I'm opening the public hearing. You're up. That's what I was trying to do. Oh, you did it. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I just wanted to clarify on this one. We we um, have since opened up that access to the north, so it would be the scenario B that would allow traffic to flow kind of through the Walmart parking lot, which that's Walmart that's selling that parcel, um, and then also have a secondary or second access through the El Pollo Loco. Um, we've, we have also communicated with El Pollo Loco about, um, coming in, um, and their cons to see if they had any concerns with traffic that we could help mitigate. Um, we, um, looked at a couple different options of like potentially trying to move access locations, but, um, on the El Pollo Loco site, but it, it didn't really work with with grading or city code or any of that. Um, and so that's kind of why we opened up that one to the Walmart to kind of help help appease all the parties there. Um, yeah, and so I just wanted to kind of let you know that it, it is scenario B that we're planning to move forward with. Um, yeah, so I'm just. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay, this is a public hearing. So if you'd like to speak on this item, please approach the lectern and uh, speak with your name and you'll have three minutes. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back up to the commission for a comment and or motion. Do we have motion available on the slides? Oh, there we go. Well, I'd have to pull up my phone. All right. Uh, based on the findings set forth in the staff report, I move to the Planning Commission approve the preliminary site plan for Raising Canes, located at 7671 South, 3800 West in the SC3 zone, with the requirements of approval listed on page two of the staff report. Commissioner Sheldon? I second the motion. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, carries five nothing. Next, yeah. uh, based on the findings set forth in the staff report, I move the Planning Commission approve the Administrative Conditional Use Permit for Raising Canes, located at 76, 76 71 South, 3800 West in the SC3 ZC zone with the condition and requirements approval listed on page two and three of the staff report. Commissioner Shelton. I second the motion. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> okay, that carries five nothing. All right. Thank you. Okay, this will be on um, public hearing with the Planning Commission recommending to the City Council for final action. Um, item four, the villa at Stone Creek, 4977 West, 7800 South, future land use map amendment for approximately 30 acres from professional office, medium density residential, neighborhood commercial and parks and open land designation to medium density residential and neighborhood commercial and amend Stone Creek master development plan, PC zone. Uh, Peterson development, Ryan Peterson. Oh, okay. You don't look like Ryan, but <laughs> push the button. On the right, yeah. That button, okay, there we go. Um, I'm Kaylin Nichols and I'm representing Peterson today. I am not Ryan. <laughs> um, so just to give a little bit of the history on this parcel, it's part of the Stone Creek um, master plan community, the 285 acres. Um, it's between 4800 West, 5600 West and 7800 South, 8200 South. Um, the property, as you said, we're discussing tonight is 30 acres and it's the last large parcel in this community to be, to be developed. 
and we've been working on this for a very long time. So we're excited to um, see what the possibilities are here and, and get this moving. Um, in 2000, Albertsons purchased the parcel. If you can see it right in the middle, the large parcel, um, 6.27 acres. And that was supposed to be the major anchor of this commercial, this neighborhood commercial center. And um, then they pulled out of Utah. So we were kind of stuck with a commercial center without an anchor. And as many of you probably know, that doesn't fare well for the other tenants who might come. So um, we've just kind of sat on this property to see what was gonna happen with it. And just recently, Peterson's were able to buy back that parcel from Albertsons which gives hope to this parcel again. <laughs> and um, that's why we're here before you today. Um, we've, ex we've been excited about the possibilities with this. We don't see it as a commercial center anymore, just because after 20 years, things have shifted a little bit. We've had Mountain View Corridor go in, 5600 West has become a major north-south thoroughfare, whereas 4800 West hasn't grown in traffic that much. So. Um, we've kind of shifted our view on this and and we're trying to see what could what could possibly go in on the site other than commercial as a as a big anchor as a big center um, and as west jordan's general plan calls for commercial development should go around nodes um, around major arterials and interchanges freeway interchanges like mountain view corridor 5600 west 7800 south that node and especially the future node at 90th south and 56 West with the freeway interchange there too. So we've got some major centers going on that are not very far from the center that will pull commercial away from here. Um, so in 2018, as we've been looking at the general plan and, and what has happened in the last 20 years, we rezoned 13 acres on the northeast corner of 56th and 78th to be a neighborhood commercial center. It was residential and we rezoned 13 acres to be commercial, which I don't know if you've been out there, but that's the Culver's and the Costa Vida that's coming in, the Pizza Hut, the Sherwin Williams. So that's that's really happening, <laughs> and uh, that just proves that, that that corner is where the commercial wants to be. Um, so the the property we're discussing today, as you can see on the map, um, we are changing it from professional office, medium density residential, neighborhood commercial, and then parks and open land. Um, we're not really changing the parks and open land. We're just updating it to follow where it's currently going. So we're not, <laughs> it's a little confusing. We're not getting rid of the parks and open land. But um, we are proposing medium density residential, neighborhood commercial just on an acre on the corner, and then the parks and open land. In junction, we're amending the Stone Creek Master Plan just to reflect what we want to do on this site. Um, we're proposing it to be a senior campus, a senior living campus where um, there will be 116 senior villa units and an assisted living center. And then um, as a buffer, we'll have eight single family lots on the southwest adjacent to the existing ivory lots. Um, so the change is approximately 16 acres from neighborhood commercial to uh, medium density. So our, our zone changed from 13 acres to commercial where it belonged. We feel kind of took a lot of the commercial that would go here and we put it where that node is where it will be successful. Um, we actually commissioned a senior housing and assisted living market study and this site was determined to be ideal for a senior living campus. So we we're pretty excited about this idea and um, we've developed two different senior campus ideas in South Jordan, if you guys ever want to go out and visit them, we'd love to have you see them. Um, they're just right next to the Costco. One is Harvest Crossing Villas and the other is currently being built, it's the Haven. And um, they're not quite as ideal as this site because our assisted living is more on the major road and not connected into the neighborhoods, but it's still between the two. So um, we also have a senior living campus that we're developing in Heber same kind of idea where there's an assisted living building um, in conjunction with senior units like this. And they've been really successful. Um, it just makes it so the, the residents who come here to live, they don't have to leave when they need more care. They have an option to receive that care, but not leave their neighborhood, not leave their friends and their, their family pretty much that's right there as they've grown to love their neighborhood. 
Um, we've teamed with Covington Group. Um, they would be doing the assisted living portion of this project. Um, they've done a lot of different assisted living buildings and they know their stuff. They're very expert in this, um, this realm. So we're excited to team with them on this. Um, so as you look at this project um, to the north, it has medium density. It's part of a PC and R110 zoning and they're single family lots. But of course we're right next to 7800 South. So there's that buffer between um, 4800 West to the East and then single family. Uh, to the South is our park and Barney's Creek trail system and then single family that's part of um, the planned community of uh, Stone Creek. And then to the West is public facilities. There's two water tanks and then ivory development that is single family. And our lots will be very similar to those in the ivory development. And we're, we're excited for this because the, the intent of Stone Creek was to give a range of housing to provide for a whole, so you can live your whole life in this area, in this community, it, whether it be a starter home or a, an apartment you start in. And it would be great for a lot of the residents that I've talked to, they, they've looked for places for their either themselves or their aging parents to come and be part of the community. And we feel like this is a perfect, perfect addition to Stone Creek. Um, next thing, phasing. There you go, thank you. <laughs> um, phasing, we have phase one would be um, 56 units in the clubhouse. And this is mostly important because when we discussed water with the city, that is what was allotted for current development. Um, future water will come and that was decided in a, a draft development agreement we have with the city. So we know that phase one will have water provided for it and the subsequent phases will come um, shortly after six to 18 months they estimated. Um, some of the amenities you can see on the plan, we have a 2.12 acre village green in the middle and adjacent to that there's a clubhouse and walkways to go around and there'll be seating and um, trees for shade on those benches. Um, the clubhouse is in the middle as well. It's about 3,000 square feet with a kitchen gathering space and a fitness room. Um, there will be an outdoor hot tub and outdoor pool and a pickleball court right adjacent to the clubhouse. Um, one of the biggest features is the pedestrian walkways that are connect, gonna connect the whole community together and then to the outside trails that connect all of Stone Creek together. Those trails are heavily used and it's awesome to think of connecting another portion of Stone Creek to those trails. Um, the range of housing, I'll just go over this very quickly. Um, the, the villas are four plexes and they have shared driveways. There's four units on each driveway. Each unit has a two car garage. So parking is really not an issue. Um, each, each unit has a two car garage, including the uh, single family lots. They will each have a, at least a two car garage. Um, the, each of the floor plans for the villas is 2,400 to 2,569 square feet. So there are four different plans to look at, um, to choose from. And they have their, their main floor living, but then they have a bonus room above. So there's a little more space to them. Um, our single family homes are gonna range from 1,700 to 2,000 square feet. And they're very similar to the Peterson Common Homes that we just recently have completed. So um, the assisted living building, that's a little bit out in the future, but um, we're looking at possibly 60 beds um, and two to three stories. We placed it where it was, not just for visibility, but because it's adjacent to the water tank. So it won't impact the, the existing residents who are there if it does go to three stories. So, um, all the roadways internal will be 50 feet wide public streets. The driveways will be maintained by the HOA and there is one fire lane that will also be uh, maintained by the HOA. Um, fencing, I'm not sure if Ray has a fencing, but there'll be um, walls along 7800 South, 4800 West, and then a wrought iron fence along Hayden Peak Drive, just so that we can maintain the visual connection to the trail system and the and the awesome antelope that run through that trail system so that the seniors can enjoy that. Um, there will be vinyl fencing along the lots, the single family lots. And I know there's one or two of the homes of ivory that are still not fenced. So we will fence those to make sure that they're private. Um, guest parking, 
We currently have it just at the clubhouse because we do provide two stalls or two garages per unit. Um, we could put additional parking in, in various places if it's needed. As far as open space, I did mention the 2.12 acres of open space in the middle. Um, overall, we've got 9.3 acres of open space throughout the whole site. So we're at 34% of open space and that open space will be maintained by the HOA. So the seniors don't have to worry about that. Um, utilities, this is my last <laughs> point. Um, water use, we had a utility comparison study done and water usage and sewer will be pretty typical of a residential. The, um, it will increase over the current use, but typical of residential development. Um, I mentioned that we will have water for phase one available and we will just be waiting on phase, the rest of the phases for water um, per the city allowing it. So um, storm drain impacts are not anticipated to vary between the two uses, the current and the proposed. And traffic, and this is a great one, traffic will decrease by 12 to 25% from the current land use to the proposed. And that's a great thing for the residents in this area to know that this isn't gonna cause more traffic issues. Um, and finally, fire protection and required fire flows are anticipated to decrease with the proposed land use. So, thank you for your time. I have a couple questions for you. Thank you. I have a question on the traffic. How, you said it would will reduce traffic. Could you explain that? In yeah, in our in our study, so uh, the commercial. Commercial actually drives a lot more traffic than residential. And when you put assisted living and seniors, it decreases it even more. So um, when they say decreases by 12 to 25% of the current land use. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. Now. Gotcha. yeah. Okay. My last, my second question, will the single family home lots be included in the HOA as well? No, they will be separate. They won't have to pay into the HOA. They will just have their own yards to maintain. Okay, thank you. Yes. Commissioner Sheldon. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the parking, guest parking in this area. Will there be any street parking allowed within the HOA? Um, it will be allowed just per city ordinance. Um, so during the winter, it won't be allowed when there's snow. Um, but as per guests, we have, I know that assisted living and seniors have a lot of visitors. And so if it is needed, we can add additional parking if they see. Um, the driveways are deep enough. They are 20 feet in the shared driveway. So they're two car garages and then they have 20 feet off of that for parking if their guests can park there. But that so will definitely be temporary. That would that allow for two guests perhaps? Yeah. Like if they had two cars in the garage, yeah. that would allow two cars outside of the garage. Mm -hmm. okay. It would require careful backing out if both houses have guests at the same time. But, but yeah, they can park. Yeah, I was, my thought was, yes, yeah, seniors may have a lot of children that want to come visit. Uh, what if they have a big gathering? Um, so a little bit of just small concern for uh, how much parking might be available to a senior who lives in this place. Yeah, that's a, a great point. And yeah, we can add, we can definitely add some more parking um, along the open spaces and um, like I said, the two two car garage plus two parking stalls. There, the parking is temporary in the driveways, though, so it'll be, you know, for parties and visitors, but but not for three cars to stay there. Any other questions? Oh, Commissioner Allen. Thank you. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to Hayden Peak Drive uh, getting finished. Uh, if you can do that within the next six years, that would be great. So I can actually use it with my youngest. But uh, all of that said, if, if everything's successful, I, I, I'm looking forward to that. I think uh, the solution is good. I think it's a good balance with the the neighboring areas here, as well as a little bit north on 4800 South. Uh, there's a lot that I like about this. Um, I've got a handful of questions. So on, on your landscaping plan, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of green on this. Is there a balance with Xeriscape that would be eventually put yes, in? Yes, a lot of it will not be grass. Okay. It's just showing general open space right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, your access to 7800 South, has that already been approved by UDOT? Or is that, do you have a guarantee? That is 
the curb cut is actually already installed. It was dedicated when they were going to put in the Albertsons. And so we've shown it there. We've actually discussed maybe removing, making it a smaller access just to the assisted living and then connecting through and cutting out that access to the community just to quiet it down. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in discussion. So Okay. Uh, last question I have uh, is the, the phase four. Is that a commercial? Yes, it's a, it could be an office or a retail building. We don't know exactly what we're, we would love for it to be a supportive service for the seniors. We would love it to be an office or a, mm -hmm. yeah, an eye doctor or a physical therapist or something like that to right. support and, them. Yeah, and I think it would be, it would be nice. Certainly that the areas can be much quieter than it would be with commercial in this particular area. And you made a statement that I absolutely agree with. The commercial hub uh, for this area is a little bit further to the west, just prior to Mountain View. We really need to concentrate on commercial hubs further to the west in order to, to continue supporting that community. But uh, what happens, I'll, I'll say if, phase four, you, you just can't find a tenant, very similar issue to what we have now. Is there a plan B? Um, plan B with this just being preliminary, plan B currently is detention. <laughs> um, we're not exactly sure the rate of detention, I mean, how much we need for this community. So yeah, that would probably be plan B. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, Ray. Thank you. <clears throat> Members of the Planning Commission, Mr. Chairman, the applicant did a great job at walking you through the um, what's on the table tonight. Um, again, just to reiterate, you're not looking at rezoning the property. It's uh, basically just uh, updating the uh, the master development plan and then um, also the F amendment to the future land use map just to make it so that's consistent with what's being proposed on the property. Um, we really don't have any issues with uh, what's being proposed. We think it's a good fit for the area good fit for the neighborhood and how it's laid out. We really like, um, really like that. Um, so we really don't have any issues with it. Um, our recommendation is for approval. Okay, Commissioner Quinney. Uh, I think you answered my question. So thank you for pointing out that we're just doing uh, a map amendment. So I was wondering where the SHO is at. So I'm assuming that that will be coming down the line that we'll put an SHO on this to make sure that we restrict it to senior housing. No, this is just, this is handled through the uh, master development agreement. But it will be, I, that's, will my be only, that's my only concern is that it will be, that, it, that we can enforce it to senior housing, right? That at some point Ken can't go down there and, and jump in there because he really likes the new, the new fourplex layout. Right. <laughs> okay. Just making sure. Yeah. So, so that yeah, to help, I want to make sure he doesn't live too close to my buddy, Greg. <laughs> to help answer that question, this is the PC zone. And of course, the PC zone allows a lot of uses, as Ray mentioned. Um, part, an integral part of the master development agreement is this master development plan. So they can't vary from this plan, you know, other than obviously changing slightly the, you know, the exact layout of the streets or whatever, but it has to be consistent with this. Once it's approved by the council, it has to be consistent with this master development plan, which includes that senior senior housing. The master development agreement specifically lists the number of units of senior housing and of each type of housing. So those are the maximum amounts that they, they can put in. So it is nailed down if that's your question, yeah. Okay. We'll go ahead and open it up for uh, public hearing. If you're here to speak on this item, please uh, approach lectern, say your name, and you'll have three minutes to speak on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> go ahead, sir or ma'am, whoever's online. Yes, uh, my name is Thomas Curry. Um, I currently live on the other side of 7800 uh, on, at 4959. Uh, so my backyard back 78. So technically my backyard would be facing that property. Uh, would uh, you kind of touched a little bit on fencing? How would there be a cement wall on that side of 78 or would it be a regular white fence like how it is for my, for my side? Um, and if so, the, the, 
side of 78 the that are the, the residential families that are backing 78 um have kind of talked with me and agreed that we would like uh, a cement wall retaining wall it be either put on our side or on their side to either one reduce noise two for safety concerns i know you said that it would reduce traffic by 12 to 25 percent um, but already with the 78th opening up uh, i've been here for five years and there's been three accidents along 78th uh, one has been through a retaining wall, and if it wasn't for the retaining wall, it would have gone, that car vehicle would have gone through the fence and through that back home. So our, my concern and the, the families that are backing 78th concern is safety-wise of m possibly more increased traffic and the ways that um, you guys or the city can alleviate that stress for these families. Okay, this is not for that development. So really your best bet is to either contact your uh, representative or it's one of the city councilmen and see if there's something they can do. But this is for the project on the other side of the street. No, it's going to be on the oh, I'm sorry. I, you're, We're also not responding to comments, right? Yeah, um, if you'll just hold on to your comment and uh, maybe we can address it after the public hearing. Okay, another person. Okay. Go ahead. Hi. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Mitch Larson. I live um, in the townhomes right there at Princeton Park to the west of this new development. Um, I don't have any opposition to the development itself, um, but my biggest concern is I live right in front of one of those stub roads that's going to be opened up, um, the Bayard Lane, and then I'm a little concerned about the Hayden Peak opening up as well because I think we already see pretty high traffic speeds. Um, to the neighborhood, and I'm worried that Hayden Peak opening up is just going to increase um, a lot of traffic around the school and, and through the neighborhood as well. And so I think um, no opposition to the project, but I'd hope that there'd be some measures taken to uh, control the speed on the roads and, and help minimize um, any issues in front of, especially around the school. So um, that's my comment. All right, thank you. Anybody else online? Okay, now we'll go ahead and open it up. Hi, my name is Greg Hatch. Um, so is there going to be a sidewalk? There's not currently a sidewalk on 78th from the, the water tanks clear around the corner to where it, it actually reaches uh, Barney's Wash. And so I'm just wondering if there's a sidewalk going in there as part of the build. Um, and then on where it has phase three, there's a, a little cutout that goes over Barney's wash. I actually live just above the V on Villas at Stone Creek. And, and I'm just wondering if there's, if it's connecting, if there's any plans to connect that or, or uh, what, what the plans are with that unique shape uh, at the bottom part of Hayden Peak Drive. So those are my questions. So. Thank you. the right button hi i'm melanie bowles i live on the east side of 4800 west i too am curious about the safety of children in that there is a sidewalk on the east side of 48 but not on the on the west side and also hayden peak you can see right there at hayden peak that is where the crossing guard is and crosses children to cross through they come through the bike path my question is what happens to the bike path for those of us who walk there who hike there who ride our bikes there um and so my question is, is there going to be a traffic light there in order to have that crossing and when you i i have a hard time comprehending that's going to be less traffic when you add 125 cars in that neighborhood coming and dropping into 4800 West and how it will impact the park that's on the South. Thank you. I'm Dot Seeley. I live in Princeton Park, this is just to the West. Um, I have a hard time understanding the reduced traffic as well. 
um, we've seen that 7800 South has had to be widened numerous times. And I don't think that it's gonna get smaller, especially with the traffic that's out West. Is there a provision so that we can move or allow some, uh, some area so that when, when it comes time to, to widen 7800, that it will, it will have enough room to do that and not affect the homes that are there. Also, I live in Princeton Park. Um, I didn't know when I moved in that the uh, garages are supposed to be two car garages, but you have to be a real good driver. And I only have one car and I'm really grateful for that. But it says two, two, two in the driveway. Um, it, in our area, you've got teenagers and they have cars and mom and dad have a car and then the teenagers friends come over. There are times when we can't pass through the, the drive or the roadway because there are cars parked on either side. And whether the city ordinance says don't park there for the winter, eh, it happened, it, it never happens. There's always somebody there because there's no place else to park. Um, she said there'll be provisions. Um, I think we need to put in place the provisions in advance so that we can have some place for those cars to go. And I'm looking forward to phase five. I really hope I'm not dead by then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before we close the public hearing, would you like to comment on any of those? everything is just make it as short as possible so um the single family will be allowed two stories or 35 feet the fourplexes like i said are they're a main floor living but they do have a bonus room so two stories 35 feet um the phase five the assisted living would be a max of 45 feet or three stories and then the um commercial would be 45 feet max or two stories um, as per the question on the trail, the proposal that we are that we've submitted, um, we would be finishing instead of putting in a sidewalk on the south side of Hayden Peak Drive, we would be installing a 12 foot trail that would connect to the existing trail that the city has put in to help the kids get across. Um, right now, it kind of cuts across where the street is proposed, so we would be rerouting it and making it connect to the sidewalk where the kids go to school. Um, and then on the north side of Hayden Peak Drive, that would have sidewalk, and we would be um, required by city to put in the sidewalk on 7800 South and 4800 West to connect it all. Um, so yeah, that it will all be completed with sidewalks and that. And, that, and um, as per plans right now, we don't have any requirements to put in traffic calming, but of course that's always a discussion to be had as we go through engineering and, and I'm sure they will have comments on that. So that will be taken care of. Yeah, that road is really busy through Hayden. My, my kids go to Hayden Peak, so um, that road will get really busy. So traffic calming probably will be required. Other questions that I didn't didn't. There were answer. a couple of questions, I, if I could. Um, um, that was, we have to suspend the rules because this is still I was just going to remind her of questions that other people had. So It's still a public hearing, though. There was one question, I think, regarding walls. We are putting in concrete walls along 7800 South and 4800 West, as proposed. So. And the sidewalk. And she and spoke sidewalk. about the sidewalk. Is that, sorry, yeah, okay. she did say there was a sidewalk. I think you caught everything, at least I. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, close the public hearing right now and bring it up to the commission. Commissioner Shelton. So a question for the applicant. Yeah, I mean, you do remember under your rules, once you close the public hearing, you can actually ask questions of the applicant and then discuss it as a okay. planning commission. So that's probably the stage you're in now before you discuss right, thank it. Thank you. Yep. There were just a couple of questions that I, I heard that weren't touched on. Um, one person on the phone call asked what type of wall, and I believe you already addressed it, but just if you could reiterate the type of wall that will be uh, along 7800 South. Yeah, it'll be a, a precast concrete wall, six foot. 
yeah, I think you already told, but they may have missed it. And then the next question was, uh, what is the flag that reaches down into the gulch on phase three? Yes, that's a parcel of open space that has a trail in it currently, but it was never dedicated. So it's just gonna remain as open land as it has. It just was never, it's just kind of an outlier in the parcel. Yeah, just kind of like if a piece of street that you're adding to the street, this is just a piece of trail and open space added to the open space, right? It's already used as such, but now it's formally, formally dedicated, dedicated as such, right? Yeah. Thank you, that was all I had. Okay, Commissioner Allen. Yeah, since you're up here already, <laughs> I, one of the questions came up, and uh, I think it was a good question. That is that now intersection of Peyton Peak Drive and 4800 West. I, I understand 4800 West is pretty much that's the amount of traffic we're going to get. Period. There really isn't any more development there. Uh, but certainly during school, we're going to see, myself included, people leaving the school this direction instead of heading up toward Grizzly. Uh, I don't anticipate it's going to be enough to add a traffic stop or a traffic light, excuse me, or anything like that in that particular area. Have you done any traffic studies to understand what that additional flow would be during the <coughs> or just be during drop off or pick up of the school? We have not done a traffic study for that particular use. Um, the master plan has always shown this road connecting through either to 78th or to 48th. So our initial traffic studies did show the flow of traffic from the school. Um, those peak hours are going to be tough. And I think um, at minimum, they're going to have to have a crossing guard at that point just to make it a little safer. But um, that can also be part of our discussion with engineering and planning as we move forward. I forgot one. <laughs> could you, uh, for those present and on the phone call, if, if you could explain a little better how uh, there will be a decrease in traffic based on approved, current approved land use versus what you're proposing. I think people have the impression that putting this in, you're suggesting that putting all these units in will decrease what's currently there. And that's not the case, is it? Um, it actually decreases just based on the land use itself because commercial has higher traffic counts. And so, and we do have a, a preliminary traffic not necessarily a study, but a, an agenda <laughs> that shows um, the traffic counts for the current use and the proposed use. And it just, it showed a decrease. So that's. So I think it, what you're saying is that compared to what was previously planned, what that increased amount would have been, what you're now proposing is less of an increase than that would have been, right? So, yes. so it's not, it's still an increase. It's just much less of an increase uh, compared to the other use that would have gone there. Yes, that's right? correct. Okay. If we had gone forward with a commercial center, the traffic would have been 18 to 25% more than the, the residential use that we were putting in. Thank you. This is more for staff, so either Duncan or, or uh, Larry. On the master development agreement, knowing that that is an older document, it's been around for a while, uh, it's either already addressed or needs to be addressed, but the road widths as well as the landscaping, are those now going to be brought up to date to conform with current standards as opposed to what was going on at that point? I think <clears throat> this is just like the first stab at it. So this is just a concept concept level right now. So where we'll be getting into the actual road widths won't be until we start getting into the site plan review. And that'll be coming back to you to take a look at in the future. There'll be five different subdivision plats coming back to you, right? Yeah. For each phase. Yeah. So, and maybe I'm misunderstanding then. When we've got a master development agreement, that changes code slightly, right? That, that in other words, they're they're held to the master the the provisions of the master development agreement over code. Am I understanding that right? Typically, when there's a master development agreement, they're held to the standards at the time the agreement is made. So there may have been certain things that were locked in with their original master development plan, but otherwise they'll be required to follow current standards. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and it sounds like something that would just be addressed as we move forward. So yeah, I, 
Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Any comment? Okay. Does somebody want to make a motion? I, I'll make a motion. If, if okay. We to it. We're getting there. All right, uh, so amending the future land use map. Based on the information finding set forth in the staff report upon the evidence and explanation received today, I move to the Planning Commission for a positive recommendation to the City Council to amend the future land use map from professional office, medium density residential, neighborhood commercial and parks and open land designations to medium density residential and neighborhood commercial for the villas at Stone Creek development located approximately 4977 West, 700 South in the PCCC zoning district as discussed in the staff report. You're in the wrong. <laughs> I'll second that, but boy, man, that was speedy. I'll, I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I think in one breath. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, it carries five nothing. Want to try the second one? Yeah, let's go. It's a lot shorter. <laughs> Uh, based on the information of findings set forth in the staff report upon the evidence explanations received today, I move to the Planning Commission for a positive recommendation to City Council to approve the revised master development plan for the Bills of Stone Creek as discussed in the staff report. Commissioner Ratch. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, it carries 5 nothing. Okay, next item on the agenda. Item number five, text amendment pet boarding, amend the 2009 West Jordan City Code amending pet boarding as a conditional use in section 3-5E in the SC2 Community Shopping Center Zone and the SC3 Regional Shopping Center Zone amending section 13-6K interchange overlay zone IOZ adding pet boarding as a conditional use and removing the kennel as prohibited use, amending 13-2-3, adding a definition for pet boarding, citywide applicability, and looks like Larry Gardner. So the mayor wanted me to put a picture of a dog on a skateboard, but I don't have one. So, <laughs> so we talked about pets uh, a couple of meetings ago. Uh, it's becoming increasingly, well, I don't know, I've always had pets, but it's becoming more popular, the type of different uses um, uh, that take care of the needs of pets. Uh, pet boarding is different than kennel, and as I said in the staff report, generally in the industry, kennels are associated with a veterinarian office or someone who does pet grooming. It's not overnight, it's just they shove your animal in a cage and they keep it for a few hours and then it goes home with you. So pet boarding, um, this is a definition um, that I have come up with, licensed commercial indoor outdoor facility where household pets are boarded and cared for on a temporary basis. Pets are kept in pens, not cages. Um, think of a pen as like a, a stall for a cow and not a cage for a lab rat or something like that. Okay. Um, outdoor recreation area equaling 25% of the square foot footage of the building is provided and 50% of the closed floor area of the building is used for open recreation. Um, I've done a few of these in my career and the most successful ones are where the pets can uh, gather together and socialize, as they like to call it. And so the indoor, well, not cats and dogs, usually dogs, but um, I guess they do allow cats here also. Um, but uh, so they're allowed to roam free, jump, run and play, be happy. And many of the more modern ones have cameras set up so you can view your animal while you're in your office. Uh, or at home or wherever. Um, so this proposal would make it a conditional use in the SC2 zone, SC3, and IOZ. Um, the reason it's not an SC1 is that it's generally too close to residential areas. And, and the, I'm not saying there's a problem with barking, but there may be. And so we decided to keep it more in the hard uh, commercial zones. The IOZ is 
the commercial in AOZ is generally right next to busy corridors, so that it shouldn't be an impact to residents. Uh, candles removed is a prohibited use in the AOZ to avoid confusion or for the fact that uh, veterinarian is a permitted use in the IOZ. And they said that veterinarians often kennel animals uh, for several days at a time if they need surgery and that type of thing. So I don't want to try to remove those, those conflicts as I see them. This is um, actually someone that has approached the city. We've been approached a couple of times. This is a a facility they just opened in Pearland, Texas, wherever that is in the great state of Tejas, I'm not sure, but it's a, I think it's around Houston. Um, as you can see, they have the outdoor areas for the animals to recreate. And then inside and the bottom right hand corner is uh, the indoor area where the animals can socialize. And so staff recommends approval of this. I think this is a, just another one of those businesses that uh, 20 years ago would never be imagined that is becoming increasingly popular in the world we live in. So if you have any questions for me. I have a comment. I have watched my dog on one of those cameras, just so you know, it is a thing. And it was very entertaining. I mean, considering it was my dog. So. Did, he, did, he, did he behave? She did, yes. She did, she okay. It. Yeah, okay. it was great. And they even took pictures, and I came home with a picture of her happy. It was, like, <laughs> incredible. Um, I think this is great. So I really appreciate you taking the initiative on this and doing this. I think we need it. Commissioner Allen. I absolutely agree with that. Two questions. Uh, what about using a manufacturing zone? Um. This is a professional opinion. I don't like cluttering manufacturing zones with things that aren't manufacturing or industrial. If the Planning Commission wants to forward that recommendation to the City Council, I can support whatever you want. But I really like to keep our industrial areas uh, so those type of uses can thrive there. And the more, I'm not a, I know that we allow different things in manufacturing, dance studios and churches, and I don't like that, but that was before my time, so. Okay, good, good explanation. Could you go back a, a slide to the definition? So more of a question, good practice uh, in my mind is typically when you have a word or something you're trying to define to try to keep that word out of the definition, in this case, boarding. Is there something else we can refer to this as? I don't know, pet hotels or use that same kind of term as hotel. The reason I say that is boarding is also used in the definition of kennel. And I, I don't want to confuse the matter. Um, I'm open. If you want to call it a pet hotel. I haven't the foggiest. I've been thinking about this since I read the package hey, this weekend. I don't when know what Kelvin I'm questioned the grammar, he had a solution. So you got to come with a solution, or you can't have a comment. So I, I will, I will think of synonymous terms and take that forward. What, to the what do we code. call hotels in in the code? Are they hotels? There's hotels, and motels. Yeah. What if we call it a, a pet hotel, a pet, a pet luxury club. facility, or something like that? Right? <laughs> or you could just change the word in the definition. So instead of saying boarded and cared for, it could be housed and cared for. And then also change that in their kennel to housed. Sure. Yeah. Kennel, the definition of kennel has board in it. So that was my primary. Yeah. I like that. Let's do okay. that. Right. I know. I'm picky. No, no problem. We'll change. I hope you wrote that down, Duncan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more questions before we open this up? Is there anybody online? Nope. Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up for a public hearing. We have three minutes to speak on this item if you'd like. Okay. We'll bring it back up to the commission for comment and or motion. I'm I'm with Larry. Let's leave the M1 alone. Uh, and on that note, based on the information and findings set forth in the staff report and upon evidence and explanations received today, 
I move that the Planning Commission forward a positive recommendation to City Council for this application with Commissioner Ammon's suggested word change. Commissioner Shelton. I second my motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, carries five nothing. Okay, next item is the text amendment, non-conforming signs. Amend the 2009 West Jordan. So, no, yeah, I did. Okay, now I'm off my place. All right, amend the 2009 West Jordan City Code section 12-4-5, material enhancement adding language that legal non-conforming signs can be relocated and re constructed as a result of public action only if the relocated reconstructed sign meets all the provisions of section 12-4-5 of the West Jordan City Code and it looks like Larry you've got this one yes um so a legal non-conforming use or a sign is something that existed uh under a zoning ordinance ordinance prior and a zoning ordinance is changed that may have eliminated that use or that type of sign under the current code. Uh, so it says legal non-conforming signs that are required to be removed for roadway widening or replacement may be replaced pursuant to 1246. Um, otherwise, you know, if it's not subject to a road widening, then it, it still is legal non-conforming has to be replaced if they if they want to take it down. Now, currently, the Department of Transportation is uh, and in the process of actually property acquisition for the widening of 90 South. Uh, I think this phase is from the Jordan River to Redwood Road. Uh, you know, and in full disclosure, there are several businesses along. Redwood Road, in fact, the tattoo parlor shop business. I Why do I call them tattoo parlors? I don't know. Tattoo business is in that planned community zone. Uh, there are several pole signs that are in the PC zone that are no longer allowed in the PC zone. The only thing you can have is a monument sign. Why did I push that one? And so what this ordinance would do is, and this was taken to the land use subcommittee, and they were generally supportive of it if the non-conforming sign that would be rebuilt or relocated is enhanced with architectural features. And that's what uh, A through G uh, says, it can't be any bigger than it is now, can't be any taller, but it has to have um, architectural features that improve the appearance of the sign and those architectural features have to be approved by both the design review committee and the planning commission now if because the signs are non-conforming oftentimes this is the opportunity to get rid of things that you do not want in your city any longer by the property being zoned PC and sometime in the past, pole signs being taken out of the planned community zone. It tells me in the past, either a planning commission or city council did not want pole signs in the planned community zone. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with the opinion of the planning commission that you want to get rid of pole signs. And so you would not pass this ordinance UDOT would do their taking of property, compensate the property owners for the signs, and then they would have to build um, monument signs. Now, some of these signs are fairly large and they advertise businesses that are at the rear of the property. As you've noticed along 90th South, it has been walled by businesses. Many of the businesses are behind uh other businesses and so these pole signs 
are a more effective way of advertising than monument signs. Uh, most of the property owner, owners are not happy that they cannot continue the use of their pole sign. But in full disclosure, that is the option of the Planning Commission not to pass this ordinance. And when the signs are removed, they have to be erected with something that is allowed in the, in the PC zone. If you choose to pass this, then the roadway widening portion of this would not only apply in the PC zone, it would apply anywhere in the city where roads are widened, they could replace the sign, a non-conforming sign. Uh, these are some of the signs. You can see that one at the very top. Uh, the strip mall is way at the back um, uh, in the south. And so that, that sign advertises a lot of businesses. Of course, the Legacy Shooting Center, that used to be the old granite furniture uh, sign. And then, of course, where Shopco used to be is now Walker Edison. Um, I don't know how, truthfully, they're going to relocate that sign. That business flower patch is probably going to be, you know, I, I imagine snow removal is going to put some glass out when that happens because I don't think there's any building takes on 90 South, some parking, but that business is going to be very close to the street. So, um, staff, my professional opinion is that you, uh, I would recommend approval to the to the city council for adoption of this ordinance. Do you have any questions for me, or do you want to see any other sign uh, slides? So. You have more slides. Just curious. That's a, no dogs on skateboards. I don't. Okay. Yeah, that's tough. Any questions? <laughs> Okay, we'll open this up for public hearing. Okay. Oh, I've got a question. Sorry. Uh, just on the, the pole sign versus a monument sign, is there a height limitation on the monument sign? It's six it? feet. Oh, okay. So they couldn't do a monument that's got a bunch of... No, oh, okay. six feet. All right, thanks. Okay, now we'll... Oh. Oh. Sorry. I, so I'm confused. So um, the shooting center, that's a new... I mean, that they just replaced granite furniture. That's a new sign, is that correct? They, they refaced it. They it's, refaced it's, it. Yes. And they, did they have to re, get approval to reface yeah, it? Yeah, we have a, a permit that's called a sign, uh, something you change the face of the sign. So at it. that point, we could have denied that no. permit? No. no. No, because no. They, they can continue to use a non conforming sign, okay. right. but they just can't remove it. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, changing the wording doesn't really change the sign. It's still the same sign. Kind of like when you put a new blade on an axe or a new handle on an axe, it's still the same axe, even if you replace each two or three times. Okay, any other comments before we actually open this up to public hearing? Okay. I have, I have to... Might as well. I have to confess, I'm confused by this. I'm certainly just not quite fast enough to follow. So if we, if you could, what's just in a nutshell, what are we trying to do here? So you're, what you're trying to do here is pass an ordinance that allows these signs to continue. Because the of signs. roadway, yeah, the pole signs. Otherwise, when they widen the road and take out all that nice landscape buffer that UDOT promised 30 years ago would be never go away when they widen 90th the last time is now going away. The signs have to go away. Um, if you pass this ordinance, it allows the signs to be relocated or rebuilt in a better way, but they still can have pulse on. Without, so if we pass it, we will not be requiring monument signs. No. Okay, thank you. And that, that only apply. all the other businesses can't jump on board and say, I want a pole sign now. It's only these specific property owners that are affected by road widening. Existing. Yeah. Because the new ones do have to have the monument signs. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Because the city gave them permission at one time to put that sign up. We've changed our laws, our ordinance, but we can't go back and say, oh, we changed our mind. That's when you put up, you have to take down now. So we're letting them keep it. With the road widening, that's going to be in that make that sign have to move. So if they move it right now, we don't give them permission to move that sign because it's non-conforming. 
So we let leave it there. So this will let them move that sign just from these cases only because they have no choice. They didn't choose to move it. The state's making them move it. And if you look at this area, there is no other way to really, I mean, if you put a monument sign there, it just, it won't work. Yeah, unless you put it. You could have a row of monument signs. <laughs> well, you could put one right through the <laughs> monument sign row. <laughs> that was holding up the public hearing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's go ahead and open this up for public hearing. No more comments. Do I dance? <laughs> Last public hearing. Nobody's even listening. On okay. That. We will go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back up to the commission for motion. <laughs> Jay. Hope. Commissioner Allen. Based on the information and findings set forth in the staff report, upon the evidence explanation received today, I move the planning commission for deposit recommendation to the city council for this application. Commissioner Shelton. I'll second the uh, motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'll be opposed. I'll be opposed. I, I, I'm having issues with this, so I'll be the one dissenting vote. Do I have to state why? Okay. No. Okay. It gets approved four to one. Thank you. All right. Last item on the agenda. Moderate income housing goals. And we kind of went over this in the pre-meeting. And so we're going to discuss, or did, do we need to really discuss this anymore? Other than uh, yeah, meeting? because I've got to go through, I've got to go through O through X, but I'll be quick. Okay. Um, and remember, we're, we've come up with three potential strategies. We just need one more. O is basically you apply for an entity that applies for state or federal funds or tax incentives to build um, moderate income housing. So that would be a housing corporation, um, something like that. Uh, you know, the same way we constructed the senior centers in West Jordan. Uh, is that a, a strategy you want to forward to the uh, city council or is a strategy you want me to do more research to see what the real realistic Generally, these aren't realistic unless the municipality has property they're willing to donate. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of heads going this way. No. So, all right. Um, you and member Q and whatever were taken out because uh, they were in transit or develop a moderate income housing projects for residents who are disabled or 55 years or older. Create or allow for reduced regulations re related to multifamily dwellings, compatible in scale and for to detach single family residential dwellings and located in walkable communities within residential and mixed use zones. Actually, that project we saw tonight would have been perfect. Okay, demonstrate implementation of any other strategy to address housing needs of residents of the municipality who are in the moderate income area. And so that's really carte blanche. You can come up with any of your own uh, goals that you believe that the city uh, residents would benefit from. So any of those three that you want me to do more work on or- if Maybe you. You, okay. I just like to know- And what? X. And X. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. I'm just thinking definitely um, senior housing is is a thing we definitely need in our city. I mean, not just because I fit that mold, but. <laughs> I fit it. I feel it too. <laughs> so I will, I'll, Duncan and I will discuss the possibility of uh, this development we're discussing, maybe meeting the goal of that. I don't know. The issue probably is going to be price point on what they're selling and for. When you do your research, if you would uh, kind of include some of the price points, yeah. I would be very curious on some of that stuff because, as we all know, the dollar amount makes a big difference on the decision making. So, and then X, is there anything that the Planning Commission can think of that 
uh, any programs or plans that, you know, and if you do, email them to me. I'm not saying you have to come up with it tonight at 7.30. You've gone through all these slides. There's no motion required. I'll bring this back to you at the next meeting and hopefully for to forward. <laughs> There's some questions. I have, I have questions. Uh -huh. Sorry. So isn't a lot of this developer directed? Like we can want this, but if a developer doesn't want to come into West Jordan, do we get credit if we want it and we set it as a strategy? I, I, I think if you do it as a strategy and you come up with those time frames and uh, maybe the strategy needs to be adjusted. If you come up with something that the state agrees with, then yes. And I realize that, you know, I hear all the time that people in the community want Disneyland and they want Costco and cities don't build things like the cities don't build things like the developers do. But I think if you have a strategy and achievable goals, uh, that the state will accept that because you know it's going to take some kind of uh, incentive for them to do that. Now, whether it's the incentive of waiving fees or density increases, those type of things, that really piques the interest of developers when they can see an increased profit for what they're they're doing. So, yeah, my big concern with that. Sorry, I have one more to go. Sorry, statewide applicability is that correct? So even like cities of the first class. So would Alpine be considered? No. A city? Nope. So what what is a hundred thousand or more is first or more. class? We have a little bit more requirements than some of the other classes. Yeah, I think cities, Alpine sorry. and those Gaysville? cities aren't off the hook. No, no. Yeah, no, they still have they still have to submit goals. I mean, but, some of these would be really difficult to fulfill in some of those cities. Yeah. So I guess that makes sense. I think like small towns like Marysville, yeah. the places like that don't <laughs> have to do it because okay. they most of those don't even have staff at all they okay. would be thank you i think that was wasn't that solved with the civil war <laughs> <laughs> commissioner shelton did you have a question yes uh back to v um i was thinking about the train station on 4800 west and old bingham highway and discussing a half mile radius around that train station, that certainly would impact South Jordan as well. Does South Jordan share in that, in that responsibility? Yes, because under the law, we are required with neighboring municipalities that we share a common half mile radius with to coordinate with them and meet with them on how we are going to develop the station area plan. So it would be South Jordan and Midville, you know, the Gardner mm -hmm. station one. And now if you look at the, the station you brought up, it's a good point. You think it's surrounded by single family housing. What are you going to do? Well, it doesn't mean you have to change the land use or do any type of land use, but there's no reason you can't plan for better access, better walkability to these track stations from these neighborhoods. So you can plan things like that. Doesn't mean you do wipe out neighborhoods or whatever. It just okay. means that you can improve uh, uh, ways for people to get to the the track station. That, yeah. that would probably be the that would probably be the only thing that she, would come out of a plan like that. She could do that there, especially. Yeah. Uh, one other question was: um, we discussed some. There's some things happening in the city already that may fulfill these requirements. Uh, so I'd like to see in our uh, next meeting, what are we currently doing that could potentially fulfill these requirements without having to drastically alter the the forward motion of our city? That's a that's a really good thought, you know, because as I thought about this one, especially the station area plans, I think of the Gardner Village track station. And I know our real property administrator, Dave Clements, worked really hard to get all of the accesses through UTA, UDOT, I don't know, other lands to connect a trail from that track station to the Jordan River uh, trail system, and which was just cool, right? I mean, that was an awesome improvement. And I think that's in line with what Larry was just talking about. We weren't thinking in terms of doing that as part of a stationary plan, but in effect, that's what it was, right? And 
why shouldn't we get credit for that is what it keeps coming back to. So, yeah. Okay. I think we've uh, beat this horse to death. Unless you have another comment. Yeah, I moved to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Absolutely. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you.